Mr. Blair. Mr. Mendelson, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Blair. I'm testifying on my own behalf as a resident of Ward 5. Um, as you have already heard from other people, the Office of Planning has squandered the trust that many of us once gave to it. It is well on its way to being the Office of Plotting against our interest, not of planning for them. It is hard to be optimistic about a change for the better. The problems of the Office of Planning are remarkably similar to those elsewhere in our government and in previous administrations, to problems in our public education system, for example. But no progress will be made until the existence of the crisis is acknowledged and its causes are examined. Those of us who attend to our own immediate neighborhoods may see the crisis best. Two factors seem to stand in the way of meaningful citizen participation in the planning process. One is smaller but very annoying, and the other is larger and more ominous. The smaller factor is ideology, if not theology, the cult of smart growth, true believership. If planners feel that they have the Lord Almighty on speed dial, why should they listen to me, or for that matter, to you? Experience has also shown us a larger, more ominous problem, the overweening power of big business. Between us, my wife and I have spent almost a solid man year of time, not that it's billable, participating in planning activities concerning Brooklyn's core area. In the past, potential, liars, uh, potential developers have simply lied to us, WMATA, for example. That kind of blatant lying happens less lately. The developers no longer bother to participate in public discussions. They cut their deals in private with the connivance of some uh, public office holders and some public servants. In the case of the Brooklyn Small Area Plan, the principle of restoring the vehicular connection north and south near the tracks was in the very last draft of the Small Area Plan, and it was essentially vitiated after the last minute in the final report. Sometimes a planning office has, not, has just not been around, maybe out of embarrassment. This has been the case in Ward 5 in such planning horror stories as the effort to cite a tour bus depot at Crumble School in Ivy City. The extent to which the business of the city is dictated by large corporate interest never ceases to amaze me. The tendency is to make it hard for ordinary concerned citizens to have their say and to make it very easy for the business interests. Uh, even though I take your point that the battle is not over yet, Mr. Mendelson, I want to thank you very much for organizing your colleagues on the council to thwart efforts to undo the height restrictions which have served this city so well. That was a greed-driven ideology mass plot against the people of this city. Thank you for standing with us rather than with the forces working in the shadows. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Uh, Ms. Schmidt. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. I want to thank you for your efforts uh, on behalf of responsible citizens and governance, and um, I appreciate what you do. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I have just a few points. After more than two years following the progress of the zoning rewrite, I'd like to offer some comments on the conduct of the Office of Planning. We are fortunate the director who created the zoning morass has left, but now we have to contend with the rewrite. OP's reputation has been damaged by the ambitions of its director, and there's real question this office is capable of genuinely valuing community concerns regarding zoning going forward. Office of Planning has been divisive, abusive of public concerns, and driven by visions not endorsed or accepted by the voting public. To my mind, a new planning director has to be a respected professional who's willing to work with a community to clean up the old code and refrain from remaking the city to suit trendy planning schemes. A director who can remind OP staff that their job is to serve the city and its residents, not to hand it off to developers or to create generational or geographic divides. A, thought, a director who is versed in thoughtful governance 
rather than media seeking sound bites. Zoning Commissioner Anthony Hood appears to have some sensitivity to the effects of the rewrite would have on residents, but the rewrite product OP gave him is a pathetic substitute for responsible governance. I request Can Council Mendes Mendelson that the city request the Zoning Commission step back from the flawed product they have, return it to the Planning Office for a rewrite of the rewrite. The rewrite of the rewrite needs to get back to basics, not try to make the city unlivable, not try to push young and elderly out of cars and onto bikes and buses. I, want, I wonder how many people here biked today or to these hearings held at night in the wintertime in the snow and ice. It's just so stupid. Not try to eliminate ANCs from their role in commenting on zoning changes. Not try to hand swaths of land around metros to developers. Not to encourage high dollar single person apartments and push the families out into the outer burbs. Not try to convince elderly that an in-home rental is good for them. I have personal experience with two different instances of elderly ladies victimized by home, in-home renters. This rental business in-home has been touted by Office of Planning as good for the elderly to make money. I say it's an opportunity for elder abuse, and I can point to these instances. Very sad. I'd like for us to have a planning director who comprehends that planning must take into account all the population, who respects our comprehensive plan, who uses research and public advice to drive decisions, and respects and values the inputs of its citizens. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Uh, Ms. McWood, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Um, I am testifying today to urge the Council to exert your oversight in the direction of a fundamental reorientation of the Office of Planning. The six-year zoning code revision process and the 18-month effort to gut the Height Act reveal a stunning lack of appreciation within that office for the District of Columbia as an historic planned city which serves the unique dual role of our nation's capital and the home of a diverse population of residents. It has become clear that the Office of Planning is implementing its version of a smart growth land development and use philosophy with no regard for the cautious and collaborative land use approach codified in the comprehensive plan and disdain, if not dismissal, of residents who don't agree with their approach. With respect to the HIDAC master study, the primary report produced by the Office of Planning was limited to an economic feasibility analysis. Remarkably, the findings of the study differed with the rhetoric of the Office of Planning with regard to the potential to create affordable housing, to revitalize underdeveloped parts of the city, and to stimulate more balanced job growth. Equally unsettling was OP's characterization that increased heights would improve historic view sheds when the general public was rea reacting with horror at the potential damage to view sheds. When the economic and historic preservation arguments were impeached, the Office of Planning reverted to an impassioned plea that lifting the Hyde Act would further home rule. Literally no one accepted that approach, and many were insulted that the Office of Planning would challenge widespread opposition by questioning residents' commitment to meaningful home rule. The zoning revision has been turned on its head by the Office of Planning. Many of the policies and the conditioning language throughout the comprehensive plan have been ignored. Instead, the Office of Planning focused on permitting more density and introducing a range of commercial uses into residential neighborhoods. In central DC, the Office of Planning focused on giving developers more profit by expanding the areas that could be developed to the maximum heights under the Height Act in exchange for market rate housing, and then giving them development credits to build tall office buildings or to sell credits for even more profit. The zoning revision process has been long, primarily because the Office of Planning was determined to rewrite the entire code when that was not necessary or requested. Its effort has become a flashpoint because the Office of Planning never attempted to meaningfully involve residents. Amassing a list of meetings is not evidence that anyone understands what is being proposed or that they had actual opportunities to affect the proposals. 
there was no effort to unravel zoning so that residents could appreciate what their property rights are now and what their rights would be in the future. There was no effort to explain to renters how their communities might change. The Office of Planning's goal was to reassure residents that there was no need to get involved with the zoning rewrite. At the same time, the Zoning Commission was wondering why more people weren't attending hearings and why ANC commissioners were loudly complaining about being left out. The Office of Planning has many talented employees, but the two significant examples I mentioned have positioned it at cross purposes with many residents. There is no trust. The Office of Planning is increasingly perceived as on an island with its own agenda. Going forward, I urge the council to take three actions. Impress upon the deputy mayor and the Office of Planning that economic development is a subset of planning. It is not the purpose of planning. Second, caution the Office of Planning that the council will not accept amendments to the comprehensive plan that serve to bring the plan into compliance with the Office of Planning zoning proposals. The proposals must be in compliance with the existing comp plan. Third, redirect requested OP FY15 budget for ZRR to create professional staff positions for the Zoning Commission, at least the district representatives on the commission. This would allow the com Zoning Commission to truly act as an independent body. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McWood. Uh, Ms. Auburn. Good afternoon, Chairman Medelson. I would like to thank you for your time regarding this important topic. My name is Benedict Aubrun, and I will testify on behalf of the Rick Cook Neighborhood Association. Today, we are here to provide guidelines and solutions to a complex rewrite of the zoning code. ZRR was supposed to be a review and an update of the zoning code. It turns out to be a total rewrite of the code, making it extremely difficult to read, confusing in meaning, unclear and complicated for average user to study and understand the implications of the proposed changes. Overlays are the perfect example. From low density residential zone, we see increase in density and height beyond what is currently allowed on a residential lot. Overlay makes sense, prevents intrusion of non-residential users, prohibits many current special exceptions requirements to become matter of right in the ZRR. So many OPs proposed changes don't line up and are inconsistent with the DC's comprehensive plan policy guidelines. And the comp plan is up for update in 2014. This update should precede the ZR revisions. How OP is intending to amend the comp plan to fit their zoning proposals if the zoning commission decides to approve the proposed regulations? What should we expect? We look at it as a threatening approach. What is the position of the city council and how will it proceed? The city council is in control of the fiscal year 2015 budget. We request the city council to include some conditions and tasks to the zoning agencies to guide the ZRR development and work through these suggestions. Improve the current code with the assistance of residents, ANCs, neighborhood and civic association and organizations. The description of what impact each different overlay will be subject to. A clear dictionary of the new terminology. A table of content, same as the existing code, clarification on how each current zone will be changed, and a summary of the objectives and the impact on each zone. Currently drafted, VR reduces and attacks many of the safeguards in place. Remove all limitations on zoning cases for special exceptions input from ANCs and the public. Alternate approach to different texts should be organized in a coherent manner. Regarding the Recook Overlay District, RCNA will provide the Zoning Commission and the Office of Planning specific recommendation of the discrepancies we have found, as well as our concerns and proposals to rectify major problems we have with the contents of the ZR. It has gone from a cohesive, understandable, clear, consecutive six pages to over 37 pages in seven different subtitles. They need to work with us. They assured us only of minor changes in the RICU coverlet, and that is not the case. Have the deputy mayor's office or other designated person monitor OP's outreach to residents. Include an, effi an efficient communication task force group from the ZC and OP to reach out to the residents. Provide more written material to residents on specific zones, for example, updated maps. 
provide sketches or drawings of ADUs, row houses, corner store, retail, and the impact on specific neighborhoods. City Council should confirm for zoning and planning agency only qualified and skilled candidates. Planning for an independent zoning commission and office of planning staff. HPRB and HPO should be independent agency and not under the rule of office of planning and economic development. The mayor should be advised to do this for the interest of the resident and not for the advantage of the developers. We urge the city council to use what it takes to ensure that the resident's quality of life is not being altered and residents can deal on the proposed code with a fair and clear process and make sure each neighborhood doesn't lose its character. DC is not for sale. Our neighborhoods are not for sale. This needs to stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. 